Pace, vă spunem și după masa asta, fie numele Domnului lăudat, haideți să ne ridicăm în picioare. Mare har să mai ne putem ridica. Și este un har. Bine ați venit, fie numele Domnului lăudat, haideți să ne împlinim slujba împreună, adică să lăudăm pe Domnul. El are un cuvânt pentru noi și cred ne avem așa de multe lucruri să-i spunem în seara asta și în principal să-i aducem laudele noastre. Nu descuraja Durerea ta Poate s-o aline Durerea de ce Închise adeseo Fiindcă nu știam Dar noi nu știam Durerea ta Poate s-o aline Când rătăcești Ele lângă tine Pe libertate Salvare Susi calea, să spunem tuturor Când ai credință, primești iertare Susi calea, să spunem tuturor, tuturor Când ai credință, primești iertare Iisus e calea Să spunem tuturor, tuturor Când ai credință Primești iertare Iisus e calea Să spunem tuturor El e Domn, El e Domn Durerea ta El poate să o aline Rătăcești El e lângă tine Libertate Salvare El este Liberare Lanțul greu Mena nu-i zdrobește Durerea ta Durerea ta Poate s-o aline Rătăcești
Isus. Și numai numele Lui lăudat în vecii vecilor, vrednicul și singurul Domn.
Jesús y sus Lord, Lord, I thank you for every person that's here today. Lord, I pray that you bless each person separately, Lord. Lord, I pray that you put a burning fire in our hearts for your name, Lord. Lord, I pray that you help us to long for your name, Lord. Lord, I pray that you bless this service. Lord, I pray that you bless the speakers. Lord, give them guidance. Give them wisdom, Lord. Lord, I pray that you bless the families of the church. Lord, give them guidance. Lord, give them peace, Lord. Lord, your will be done in our lives, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for what you keep doing for us and what you will do for us all the time, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. continue this service. There's one thing that I want to highlight this evening, and that is that it's all about Jesus. Amen. So if we can, one more time, sing this chorus, because we can, do, we can sit down and get comfortable and listen to the message, but if we are not focused this evening on Jesus Christ, and if we're not focused on glorifying Jesus Christ, then let's go home. Let's go home. We can go watch the soccer game. We can watch the final quarter. But no, I'll tell you what. Let's glorify Jesus Christ. Let's worship Jesus Christ. Let us enter into prayer. Let's enter into song. Focus our minds and meditate upon Christ. Meditate upon bringing Him glory. Bringing Him praise. Acknowledging what He has done for us. And that's how we should begin. That's how we should start tonight. That's how we should start every morning. That's how we should walk and meditate upon Christ every single moment let's take the opportunity as a community as a church as brothers and sisters to glorify christ together Alfa Omega, mi menú y este calle. Alfa Omega Alfa Omega Ni me nuyes de calle Dame shalom ay mare shalom Singurul brenic de laude și de închinare ești tu Se închină întreg universul în fața ta Absolut tot universul se închină în fața ta și declară Că Tu ești Dumnezeu. Că Tu ești Dumnezeu, că Tu ești Dumnezeu. Că Tu ești Dumnezeu. Că Tu ești măreț, că Tu ești glorios. Că Tu ești sfânt. Că Tu ești mare Dumnezeu. Puternic Dumnezeu, glorios Dumnezeu. Vrednic, vrednic, vrednic. 
de toată închinarea, de toată gloria, de toată slava. Ești Tu. Sunt așa de multe lucruri care ne leagă de lumea asta. Suntem distanțați, depărtați, singurați. E o luptă pe viață și pe moarte pentru sufletele noastre. Suntem trași de a vedea într-adevăr direcția și locul pe care trebuie să-L mergem. Doamne, venim în fața Ta și Te lăudăm în seara asta pentru mântuirea Ta, pentru planul Tău cu casa mea și cu casele noastre, pentru Dumnezeirea Ta arătată prin feței mele și casele mele, mântuirea Ta peste noi toți. Doamne, numele Tău îl înălțăm și îl preamărim. Numele Tău îl slăvim și îl înălțăm și vrem ca prezența Ta și vrem ca inima Ta fie văzută de noi și dorințele Tale. Avem Sfânta Scriptură în libertate. Avem părtășii în libertate. E tot mai mare presiunea împotriva strângerii și împotriva păcii. Dar în același timp, tot mai mare presiunea împotriva păcii între frați. Doamne, stăm înaintea Ta în seara asta și declarăm Tu ești Dumnezeu, Tu ești Dumnezeul mântuirii mele. Tu mă scot din necaz cu pui piciorul pe stâncă și Tu mă ridici pentru că nu e nimeni ca și Tine. Nimeni ca și Tine. Nimeni ca și Tine. Nimeni ca și Tine. Doamne, nimeni, dar nimeni, nimeni nu e nou. Dragostea Ta este noi arătată, e arul Tău și a prezenței Tale. Doamne, Doamne, cercetează poporul Tău în vremurile astea la sfârșitului. Treci, Doamne, de la casă la casă, la fiecare soț, fiecare soție, fiecare copil. Nu lăsa, Doamne, nimic să se piardă, absolut nimic. Cercetează, Doamne, te rugăm, cercetează locul acesta, începând cu casa mea, cu inima mea, cu viața mea. Te lăudăm, Doamne, și cu mea, și te lăudăm, Doamne, pentru ceea ce ești.
thank you, Lord. Before we begin, let's greet and bless one another. Welcome each other and bless each other. This evening, we're going to begin with Corey Herman with a short message. We're after the Gerasim and Jurka girls will sing a song. We're after the girls' choir will sing a song. I preached six months ago, and I was so nervous that at the end of it, I said, I'm never preaching again, in church at least. <laughs> but Frat Julian called me, and it's really hard to say no to the pastor. I mean, he called me three times. I didn't answer the first two because I didn't have his number saved. Uh, but my message is about time and how time is short. Um, time is really short. And whenever I say time is short, some of you guys are probably thinking, wow, time is short. I should probably get married. <laughs> You're not wrong. Uh, uh, James 4.14 4, says, Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Here today, gone tomorrow. That's what the Bible implies. There have been three people who have stayed in the presence of the Lord. Their name has been Job, Isaiah, and John. Job saw God and was quickly humbled. And, oh my bad. Job saw God, was afraid, quickly humbled himself, and repented. Isaiah saw God, he was afraid, and said, Woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips. He, admittedly, uh, he instantly admitted his sins. Isaiah saw, I mean, John saw God. He was also terrified and fell like a dead man and trembled before God. Three men have seen, have been in the presence of the Lord, and both of them had the same reaction. They were terrified. Don't you think for a second that your reaction would be any different? And the Bible says you're going to see him very soon. All of you have been given the same amount of time in a day, 1,440 minutes a day, 168 hours per week is all you get. That time has been given to you. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it, nor can you get more of it. The only thing you could do is use it. At the end of Jesus' life, he said, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Apostle Paul, at the end of his life, said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Two men both finished their lives, and at the end of it, they realized they had a task, and they realized they completed it. Now, what will you be saying at the end of your life? Have you completed your task? Or have you got what the world asked? Money, cars, anything else you want. You have a purpose. There are, oh my bad. There may not be a tomorrow for you and me. John 9, 4 says, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Meaning now is the time to work. Now is the time to forgive. Now is the time to seek God. You don't have enough time to be angry with your friends and family. You don't have enough time to get your feelings hurt. You don't have enough time to be bitter. You don't have enough time to complain that life isn't the way you wanted. You have just enough time to love the people God gave you, to comfort the brokenhearted, to help the ones in need, to go out of your way and help the ones in need. You have just enough time to follow God, to see God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You don't have a minute to waste on sinning. You don't have a minute to rely on repenting. All you have is a minute to read, study his word, and follow it. Any other minute is a waste. And the Bible teaches that your life is like a vapor. You might not be here tomorrow. You might not make it home tonight. There's a saying that says there's, um, that when you're 8 years old, life went by 8 miles an hour. When you're 40 years old, life's going to go by 40 miles an hour. For some of you, life's probably going by fast. You don't have enough time to sin. You don't have enough time to worry about your problems. You have just enough time to follow the words. Stay in God's word. As long as you have breath in your lungs, which have not, you have not earned it, you don't deserve it, you live your life by mercy, not by fear. If life was fair, you'll be burning in hell for eternity. That's fair. Mercy is you standing in his presence. Mercy is you having breath in your lungs. Mercy is you standing. You don't deserve any of this. It's all been given to you, so there's no reason for you to complain or waste time complaining. Um, if you all want to stand, my message is supposed to be longer, but I got nervous, said it fast. Uh, I want to go into a prayer, uh, for asking God to complete his will, use every moment they've been given because you might not be here tomorrow. 
Amen. Lord, we come before you and we thank you for the thank time you, you have given us, Lord. We thank you, thank Lord, you, for the time you have blessed us with, the Lord. We thank you for thank you, time in itself, Lord, my Savior. And in this time, Lord, may we realize how precious it is. I'll be seated. Again, we'll listen to the Gerasim Jurka girls, or after the girls' choir. And after that, we'll have a message by Moise.
Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. And I was really blessed by the songs of the girls' choir and especially by the first and last chorus because this week I was at work and all week long I had the words of that song in my mind and especially the line, the, the chorus that says, the words that say, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. And if we just think of that, how much we owe God and his grace, everything, the breath that we have, the life that we have, everything we are is because of him and his grace and how much we are indebted to the grace that God has given us. Praise be to the Lord. Thank you. My heart was blessed tonight also in the message that Corey shared. And I just want to say that, Corey, God has put a gift in you. Stir up the gift that God has put in you, Corey, and don't be uh, afraid if your feet tremble when you're up here, if you sweat. I took my jacket off, by the way. <laughs> I still do, and it's a good thing, because the Word of God should not be approached lightly, but with fear in our hearts, because our prayer, and my prayer is, Lord, not my words, but your word be spoken, and may not I or whoever's up here be lifted high, but your name alone. Because it's not a messenger, it's the message. It's not a donkey that carries Jesus in Jerusalem that the people worship. It's the one who is the Lamb of God who came to save the world. We're just messengers. And may all the attention be on him tonight. And may our, our eyes and our hearts be open to him and to his message. Let us stand for the word of God. <clears throat> and I want to read from Jeremiah chapter 1, first 10 verses. And I want to tell you before I read that, if you're a young person in here, and young qualifies from 2 to 92, this message is from you, for you. Jeremiah was a young man when he heard the message of the Lord, and this message is for all of us today. Let us open our hearts and our ears to listen to the word of God. Jeremiah chapter 1. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests of Anathoth, in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Jos Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to, and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth, and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See today, see, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant." Amen. Father, send your words and your word to us tonight, Lord, and give us hearts willing to obey and do whatever you command us to. Amen. You may be seated. I think most of us, if not all of us, are familiar with the words of Jeremiah chapter 1, especially with this, words in verse 4 and 5, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 5 especially, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, before, I, before you were born, I set you apart, I appointed you. I've heard that verse many times, and I've heard it from people that were claiming it for themselves, and and I, as I read through this chapter and, and preparing it for tonight, 
I was blessed by the words, and especially by in, in, in understanding the context, in understanding why God spoke these words to Jeremiah, they became an even greater blessing to me. I'm not going to get into that too much, although I can touch on it a little bit. Can we claim these words for us, as some people do? I say yes and no. I said no because these words were spoken specifically to Jeremiah and God appointed Jeremiah to be a prophet to the nations for that time, for that place, for that context in history where God has placed him. So in a sense, these were words addressed to Jeremiah. They, they, they were for him and they were, we will see in my message tonight, an encouragement. They, these were given to him so that he is anchored in God. When he goes to speak God's word to the people of Israel. But there are in these words, in this verse, principles that are true for us today that we can cling, on, cling to and then we can hold on to uh, when, when we need to. When life is hard and we need to go to the word of God. And there's so much truth in these words that applies to us today because the word of God is living. The word of God is true. Yesterday, today, and forever. It will not pass until the very last iota will be fulfilled. We believe that. Amen. So as we <clears throat> approach the word of God tonight, this chapter 1 in the book of Jeremiah opens up and introduces to us both the book, the message of the prophet Jeremiah, but also the person of, the, uh, of Jeremiah through whom this message came about. And tonight I would like to focus my message more on the person, Jeremiah, the messenger, and the call of God in his life. The message of the book of Jeremiah is vast, and it was spoken over a period of about 40 years. We're not going to go into that, and, and it would be impossible for me to cover that. But I want us to specifically look at Jeremiah and the calling of God in his life. Jeremiah, as we, most of us know, it's called the weeping prophet. And we see this in, in the words that he wrote. And he's called a weeping prophet because he reflects an unusual depth of emotion as he laments the sin of Judah and God's imminent judgment for the nation. When he hears God's message for the people, that cannot leave him untouched. That cannot just pass through him without changing and affecting him. And when we hear the word of God, be it for others, it always impacts us too. And Jeremiah is called a weeping prophet because when he hears what message God has for the people, he's overwhelmed with emotion. And he weeps for the people of Israel, knowing what's expect, what, what is expected to come, knowing what judgments God has um, about God is about to bring over the people of Israel. <clears throat> his message, his prophecy, uh, and his prophetic mission unfolded to a spiritually, spiritually blind and a de de uh, degenerate, decadent generation. The people of Judah were going from bad and to worse and worse and worse, day by day. And God's message through the prophet was not an easy one. It was not a pleasant one. And, and uh, in this message, and through his message, Jeremiah is trying to somehow put a stop to the spiritual decline of the people before, it's too, uh, before they've gone too far, before it's too late, before that which God has said it will happen comes to pass. In his message, he over and over warns the people of the imminent judgment of God because of the ways, the sinful ways of the people of Judah. One thing that's remarkable to notice is that even when God's word is spurned, is, is ignored, God still loves his people enough to send them messengers over and over and over and over again because God's love is so great. He's not quick to anger He's not quick to destroy, even though they have defiled his name over and over. He's still patient, patient to the people 
up to the very last point, he still gives them a chance, sends them another message, another warning. God is so good to us. Praise be to his name. Verse 1 says, the words of Jeremiah. And this points us to the human author of this book. Although we know that the author of the Bible is the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit used men, used people to write the words. Just like a pen in the hand of a writer. People were, hand, were instruments in the hand of God. And he wrote. But here the, mess, the, the author is, uh, or the writer is identified these are the words of Jeremiah. And he's identified by name here. And uh, by family, he's the son of Hilkiah. He's uh, identified here by his status. He's one of the prophets in Anathoth, by location as well. You see the place described here, Anathoth, is uh, in the territory of Benjamin. So this was in the province of, the province of Benjamin. Yet this city, Anathoth, was... A, a city designed for priests, as a res residence for priests. It was about three miles no northeast of Jerusalem. And from there, Jeremiah, although he didn't live in the city, he had a very good viewpoint of the city. He could see the city. And it's kind of like God pulling him to the side. You're not part of what's going on in that city, but you can see it. You can see clearly. And sometimes God draws his people to the side to see, to learn and observe all that's going on. The first part of verse 2, the word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year. Points to the divine origin of his message. We know that the Bible, as I said, is authored by the Lord. And though the scripture contains the words of Jeremiah, these are not just his words. These are the words of God through the mouth of Jeremiah. And I like a quote that somebody said. And he said, when God uses a person, he does not erase their personality. He wants to use that person's sanctified personality. You see, Jeremiah was a soft-hearted person. He wept, he cried for the city, and God needed a special person like Jeremiah for the message he was about to deliver to the people at that time. God handpicks people for his purposes. And for that purpose, God has called you to, he will prepare you for, just like we see here in the case of Jeremiah. The rest of verse 2 and verse 3 give us the historical time frame and setting where it happened during the... Uh, it starts by telling us that it was the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon king, Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. And uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 3 tells us that it was in the reign of, it was in the 8th year of Josiah's reign when he started seeking the Lord. And a few years later, Josiah started an aggressive campaign of reformation. In Israel, he sought to cast away the idols in Israel, he he, in, in Judah. He, he sought to bring the people back to the Lord. He sent out uh, priests and teachers of the law to teach people the ways of the Lord. He was trying to restore the real worship of God in, in, in Judah. And God has spared these two, Josiah and Jeremiah, to begin their work, both as a king, reformer who does his part based on authority that he had to bring people of Israel back to the Lord. And Jeremiah, as a prophet, as the mouthpiece of God, to speak to the people from God directly and bring them back to the Lord. <clears throat> and God raised both these men at the same time around the year 640 before Christ. This is just kind of to put a time frame in our minds of when this happened. And now that we've established this context, I want us to look at the Jeremiah's call. And I like to see what the call is about. And Jeremiah's response and God's response to Jeremiah. This is my message. This is very simple. What is the call that God has for, Jer uh, for Jeremiah? The call and the preparation. And this is verses 4 through 10. The rest of the passage that we read today. 
First thing I want us to note is this. God has a plan for Jeremiah. God has a plan, had a plan for Jeremiah's life. Just like I believe God has a plan for your life and my life. For each one of us. You are not an accident. You don't happen by chance. You're not on this earth just because your parents loved each other. You're here because God has brought you here and placed you here on this earth for at such a time as this. And God has a plan for your life. Can the young people say amen? Do you believe that? Or do you believe the lies of the world? Because see, the most important thing or the most important areas where the devil will lie to us and try to create confusion in our lives and deception is on ideas that we have about God and ideas we have about ourselves. If God can, I mean, if the devil can put wrong ideas about God in your mind, he can deceive you. But equally so, he wants to put wrong ideas about yourself in your mind just to deceive you. Who are you to think that you can serve God? Who are you to think that God cares about you? Who do you think you are? You know nobody. True. I may be a nobody to the world, but I know who I am to God. I am the one Christ died for, and that's not a small thing. I'm the one that he calls his son because he saved me by the blood of Jesus. It's important to have right ideas about God and right ideas about ourselves in our minds. And those we can develop through the word of God in the scripture. May the Lord help us to do so. You see, God had a plan for Jeremiah's life. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, God may have special appointments for some people. And the book of uh, Ephesians tells us that God has called some to be apostles, evangelists, uh, uh, prophets, teachers, pastors. This is what God does. He calls different people to different uh, ministries, to different jobs. To different appointments. But in some sense, all of us are included in God's plan. Because God has a plan for you. If he gave you a life today. If he gave you friends or co-workers. God has a plan for you in the, in the circumstances. In the circles of influence where he has placed you. All of us. God has a plan not just for those people that are up here. God has a plan for you. For your life. Just like he had for Jeremiah. And this um, call of prophet Jeremiah comes in the form of dialogue. Jeremiah says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the Lord began speaking to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah answers back. And I'm thinking of other people that God has called at the same time. Remember Moses in the desert? God calls him through a burning bush. He gets closer and he hears the voice of God calling out to him. Moses, take off your shoes, for you're standing on holy ground. Remember Samuel as a child in the temple where the Lord calls him while he's sleeping? Three times, and he thinks he hears the high priest, uh, Eli, and Eli tells him, if you hear that voice again, say, Lord, speak, for your servant listens. In this form of dialogue, we see Gideon in, the, in chapter 6 of Judges. And we see also Isaiah. While he's ministering, God shows him this vision. And God calls to him and says, whom shall I send? Don't be surprised if God speaks to you one day. Because God speaks even today. God is not death dead. God is not done speaking to the earth. God is not a God of the past. He's God of yesterday. He's the God of today and he's the God of tomorrow. And God does whatever he wants because he is God. Nobody can tell you that God spoke in such ways but he doesn't speak today the same way. Who am I to say how God chooses to speak? And he might call you. He might speak to you just like he spoke to me one day. 
not in a direct voice, but through the voice of a messenger, through the voice of a preacher who preached the word of God. And I said, God, I hear you, not the person speaking. And this is my prayer tonight, that whenever we rise here and speak in the name of the Lord, that you would hear him. They would hear his words and his message, not ours. For my words cannot change anything. Not even my kids. Only God can change from inside out. And he can change you if you would obey. And if you would heed his word. If you would just listen. And God can speak you tonight through the words of a song. Or through the words of a message here. Or even through a word of encouragement from somebody here. May the Lord use us as his voice. And this word of God comes to Jeremiah in a form of dialogue and speaks to him. And I thought how awesome this is that these words are here in the scripture. You know why? I forgot who it was, but I read a quote by somebody who said that, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here. I don't have the quote, but I was reading it and I said, and it said this, Jeremiah was Probably the most courageous and brave of all the prophets God had sent to the people of Judah and Israel. Over 40 years, his ministry had very, very, very little success. Almost none. I think there were two people that actually listened to the words of Jeremiah over 40 years. If you were to be a pastor today... He would probably close the church. No success. Preaching. Speaking directly from the Lord. Yet nobody would listen. There were two people. One was his scribe. And yet the other one I think was an Ethiopian. He had a very, very, very difficult ministry. Under persecution. Under attack. Constantly. Both uh, attacking his authority. Who are you? You're just a child. Who are you? To preach to us this message. You're a traitor because you're siding with the Babylonians. Accused of many things. Imprisoned. His life was in danger. They tried to kill him. To kill him on, on occasions. And Jeremiah needed this confirmation from the Lord. You see how good God is? God will not call you to something without giving you the strength to do it. And for Jeremiah to be able to last in this 40 years of grueling ministry with very, very little success, almost none, continuous persecution, he had one thing. He had the assurance of who called him and what God called him for. You see, and this is a key for us, whoever is in ministry, success is not and should not be defined by the multitude of people following. Oh, heretics have a lot of followers today. Success is defined by obedience to God. Obedience to what God has called us to, to what God has given us. And if ever Jeremiah in his later days, um, if ever he was overtaken by despair, and it's easy to be overtaken by despair when, when, when your mystery is so hard, he could, all, he could know that his divine purpose, his, the, God's divine plan for his life was put in place even before he had his first breath. This is, what, this is from God directly. And may this be an encouragement for all of us. If God called you to something, know that nobody can stand against you because God is the one who supports you, who sustains you. And this is why this verse here exists. This is why God gave Jeremiah this assurance. Because the road that he was going to go for, go through for 40 years, was one filled with a lot of opportunities to doubt his calling. What a beautiful message of encouragement this is. The word of the Lord came to me. Oh, I pray that the Lord of the Lord comes to us with that assurance that we need daily. That in him and through him we're more than conquerors no matter what life brings our way. And this is the word of the Lord. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart. 
who formed us, who created us, God made us. For what reason? Isaiah 43a, for his purposes, for his glory. God created us for his glory. How awesome that is. So that he can reveal his glory in our lives. God tells him, I knew you. And this knowledge is not just factual information. I knew about you. It's more of a personal. It's something that, that implies a proofance, a, a, a approval, a personal commitment. Involves so much more than just a head knowledge, just factual knowledge. When God knows us, he means I had a relationship with you. I made you personally. Psalm 139, David says, you, you need me in my mother's womb. I'm wonderfully and fearfully made. And this is how God made us. And he knows us more intimately than we even know ourselves. And God tells Jeremiah, I knew you before you were born. And I knew not just the, you, but I knew the plans I have for you. And here's my plans. I set you apart. This setting apart is for a divine purpose. God tells him, I consecrated you. Your life was made for one thing only, for me and for my purpose, for what I consecrated you for. And in doing this, God says, I appointed you. I invested you with divine authority. How awesome it is that when God calls you to something, based on this word of God, on the principles found here, we know that God calls us because he's the one that made us. He's made us for his glory and for his own purposes. And he has made us. And when he does that, he sets us apart for a specific job that he has for us. Have you ever asked yourself, God, what is it that you want from my life? I know what my parents want with my life. I know what they want me to become. I know what I want to be. I was talking to Richie earlier this week, and I told him, when I was young, I wanted to be a doctor. I studied. I prepared for it. But God had different plans for my life. And today, looking back, I'm saying, praise the Lord. I would have been married to medicine. I would have lived in the hospital today if I were a doctor. God had different plans for my life. And I'm thankful for that. I am thankful. Because God knows what he's doing. I wasn't made to be a doctor. But whatever God has made you to be, that's what he appointed you for. That's what he uh, set you apart for. Are you seeking what God wants for your life? How? The best or the easiest way is to ask him. Ask him, Lord, reveal to me, what have you created before? Why am I here? Am I here just to make money and to go to a job nine to five or whatever it may be? Just to come and keep the seeds warm in the church? What have you made me for, Lord? What is your design for my life? What is your plan for me? Because if you say you believe God has a plan for your life, the very next question is, what is that plan for your life? What does God have for you? And the follow-up to that is, am I seeking that? Am I pursuing that? Am I desiring that? Am I dev uh, devoting myself to that which God has for me? Because on the day when he will call us home, and that on the last day, when he will call us to give us the reward for what we have done here on earth, he's not going to tell, and I'm going to use myself here as an example, because I just, so I don't put anybody on the spot, but he's not going to come and say, Moise, I called you to serve me, but I'm going to say, Lord, but I was a doctor and I was a good one. I saved so many people. And God's going to say, no, I didn't call you to do that. Who called you for that? Who called you to do that? My call was to be faithful. Have you been faithful to what I called you to do? You see, there's people out there that think that God called them. And God called me to preach. But if that's the calling of God in your life, obey and do it. Paul says, I've been called to preach and woe unto me if I don't. Because God has called Paul, the apostle, to preach the gospel. And that was his mission. That was the calling of God in his life. 
But if God didn't call you, it doesn't matter how, many, how much money you make and how many church buildings you build. You know why? That's going to be zero. Because God is going to say, I didn't call you to that. I called you for my purpose. Have you sought to obey and to seek my purposes for your life? Young people, I want to challenge you here tonight. You're young. You got that going for you. Because I'll tell you what, when you're 70, you cannot, not that you can, everything is possible with the Lord. But it's harder to go back to school, to be, to ministry or to whatever. Plus, use the best years of our life, of your life, to honor God for whatever calling he has for your life. Can you say amen to that? How awesome it is that when God calls you to something, he empowers you for it. Look at Jeremiah. What's his answer? Verses 6 to 10, we see this dialogue between him and God. In verse 6, he says, Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm only a child. Oh, sovereign Lord. In these three words, there's so much there. First, he acknowledges the sovereignty of God. Lord, you're God. You're sovereign. You do whatever you want because you are God. I may have little authority here over small things, but you have authority over everyone, over everything, over all times from the beginning to end. You are God. And this expression, ah, sovereign Lord. I don't know if you're hearing that the emotion that's there. Can you hear Jeremiah with this sigh of, ah, Lord. Lord, I wish I could, but I can't. There's a deep sense that it's hard for me to put into words. What Jeremiah expressed here, ah, Lord. Sovereign God. To me, it sounds like both the desire, I want to do your will, oh Lord. I would like that, but Lord, you know I can't. And I'll tell you one thing. Jeremiah is right. You can never accomplish God's purpose and God's plan with your life on your own. And I could never do what God has called me to do on my own. Apart from God, we can do nothing. Apart from God, all you can do is a big zero, nothing. Moses tried at 40 years old. Yeah, God called me to deliver the people of Israel. And you know where he ended? On the run. On the run in the desert for 40 years to learn to do one thing. To learn one thing. And what does he say when God calls him? Now you're Moses. After 40 more years in the desert, he says, Lord, I can't. Send somebody else. And God says, perfect, now you're ready. Finally, you got the message. Finally, you learned the lesson. You can't. You cannot do it on your own because if God, if God called you to do something, it's God who does it through you. It's not you and it's not me. And the power we need is the power of the Holy Spirit in us and through us to move us, to, uh, to, to bring about the purposes of God. Not us, not me. You know why? Because I don't even know what God wants to do most of the time. Only He knows and God doesn't reveal that to me. He doesn't give me the map of what he's going to do. But you know what God says? Are you willing? Are you willing to obey? Are you willing to be an instrument? Are you willing to say, Lord, use me? I don't know for what, but use me for your glory. And I'm just going to open my mouth and speak your words. Fill me, Lord, so that people may hear whether that message is an encouragement or whether that message is a rebuke or whether the message is teaching or trying to help somebody understand. Do whatever you want, O Lord. But give me that power, your power. For in my power, I am zero. I am going to crush and burn. Many people have tried just to fail. Because apart from God, we, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Ah, oh, sovereign God. Oh, that we would acknowledge our dependence, total dependence on him. Or oh, that we would acknowledge that. Who am I? <laughs> Just like Jeremiah. Behold. 
I cannot speak, for I'm a youth. Jeremiah was probably somewhere between 70 and 17 and 20 years old, according to most Bible scholars. And especially in those times where authority was signified by white hair, where authority was signified or proven by years of experience, by a track record that goes way back and you can point to, Jeremiah had zero of that, none of that. He was a priest, probably from the family of a priest, living in the city of a priest. Very in tune with the word of God. In his style, in his writing, you can see resemblance of other prophets in the Old Testament. And you can see that he was familiar with the word of God. Yet he acknowledges, Lord, who am I? I cannot speak. I have no authority. My words mean nothing to these people. I'm just a young person. I'm reminded of Moses who says the same thing at the age of 80. Lord, I cannot speak. But you see, the contrast between the two is very obvious. Moses was 80 years old. By this time, Moses had graduated both the Egyptian schools, which were the best of the time, and God's school, which is the best ever. By that time, Moses was ready, prepared by God, and he said, Lord, I cannot speak. Jeremiah was right. He was young. He had no authority. He had everything going against him, everything to disqualify him from being the right messenger. And so many times we feel the same. Corey, I want to tell you that Jeremiah felt the same. Don't be discouraged by being afraid. The very first time I preached, I don't remember anything. I just saw the microphone, nothing else, nothing beyond the ear. And I remember after three, four minutes, I don't even know how much I spoke for. I left to go down to a chair, probably 10, 15 feet, not more than that. And during those few steps, I was drenched in sweat, just panic attack all of a sudden. But you know what? Glory be to God. Because the power we have in these vessels of clay is not ours, but it's God. And if God has called you to something, just be faithful. Being young or or inexperienced does not disqualify you from doing what God has called you to do. But even more, it proves, it proves that God has called you to. You know why? Because this is too great for you to do. It takes God. It takes God. And if God has placed a dream or or a desire, a calling in your life, one way to know if it's really from God is this. You can give up on it, but it will never give up on you. You can say, I don't want to be involved in ministry. And there were times in my life, I remember one time specifically, and I'll give this example because I don't have a better one. But one time I remember preaching, and I was young, inexperienced. I was about 22, maybe. Maybe not even 21 And I preached and I felt like that was horrible. I remember going home so discouraged. I remember going home thinking to myself, Lord, I will never ever in my life want to preach again. I don't want to. Just to have an older man come to me same day and say, I want to tell you something, young man. When you spoke this morning, the Lord gave me a vision. And he saw me, he showed me behind you an angel who was very big, tall, and he said, I called you to preach. Don't say you're not going to preach. And that day just totally changed my thinking. I said, Lord, I'm just a young person. I'm inexperienced. And I know what Jeremiah felt because I felt this many times too, and probably most, a lot of you, if not most of us, what it means to stand up here, have a lot of eyes looking at you and <laughs> with different expressions and But what I'm trying to say is this. If God called you to something, be obedient. That's all he desires from you. That's all he's called you to. And the rest is up to him and to the people listening. Their response you cannot control. But God is able to be glorified even if nobody listens through your obedience. 
And this is what you were called to. You see, scripture is full of examples of young people that were used by God. If you're a young person and you think, what can God do through me? Who am I? Just think of David. A whole army stands before one man, a Philistine. A Philistine and the whole army shakes and, and trembles and they run back. And this young man, David, comes. He doesn't even know how to, to, uh, to use a sword. And he says, no, I, I don't need those things. They're just bothering me. The armor. You, you, let, me do, let me have my God with me and I'll go to battle this guy. Because he dared bring dishonor to the name of God. And this young man, David, goes and puts a whole army to shame. You know why? Because he says, God and I can take this down. They can take this giant down. God prepared him when he was still young in his father's house by being obedient, by obeying and, and doing the chores that his dad gave him, watching those sheep and watching them faithfully. And God prepared him, prepared him while he was delivering those little sheep from the mouth of the lion and the bear. And God can use experiences you have in your life to train you, to prepare you for the moment that you are called by the Lord to stand and defend his name. Are you willing to just say, Lord, what is it that you have for me? I'm willing. Prepare me for that. David is such a good example of a young man. He stands and kills Goliath and delivers the nation from the Philistines. God used the young man. He's a young man and he becomes the leader of Saul's army. Don't say you're a young man. I'm just a youth. I'm just a young person. Think of uh, Timothy in the New Testament. Timothy, whom Paul the Apostle calls my true son in faith. My true son in faith. God used Timothy as a young man. And through the Apostle Paul, tell him, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and purity. 1 Timothy 4.12. Let no one despise your youth. You see, we as people, so many times, despise little things. Oh, that's just a small church. What influence do they have? They don't have the financial resources that we have. They don't have the people talent that we or others have. They don't have this or that. But that small church, if they have God, they have more than anything else can ever provide. A small thing. Remember the widow that Elijah goes to. She doesn't have much. But with God's Power is enough to sustain them through times of famine. Why? Because he, she puts the Lord first and the men of God. So I'll make for you. And if we die, we die. But you know what? I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to honor the Lord first. No matter what. With my little. Remember that widow that took two little coins and put them in the offering in the temple. And Jesus says she gave more than anybody else. Because that little that she had was everything she had to live on while everybody else were giving out of their abundance. What is two little coins? And in, in I had the privilege of seeing those little coins actually excavated. And, and I seen them in the class. One of my professors had them once and, and brought them to class. And this are, and, and they're like so little, so tiny. And they had no image or nothing on them. They were just so worth two pennies maybe. And they said, that's how much he had. And Jesus commands her and said, this is more than anybody else gave. You're little. Maybe a little in the eyes of the people. But if you give your little, you're nothing to God. Remember, God is able to do a lot more than you can ever do with your little. Just like the little boy who had two fish and five loaves of bread. What is that, Lord, for 5,000 people? We tend to despise sometimes. Who is this young man? Who is this young girl? Don't do that. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Let no one despise your youth. 
sometimes they're annoying with their exuberance, with their styles, with their all their... But you know, I love them in the Lord, knowing that I'm not to despise them, but to pray for them. Because in this youth right here, in this people, God has put a calling in their lives. God has called them to something. Why don't you start praying for these young people? Some may, may get on your nerves sometimes. You know what? Pray for them. Pray for them. I remember an old lady in the church 20-something years ago where I started to preach. She said to me one day, young man, I want you to know that every day I pray for you. Because I see God calling you to something. I don't know who this lady was. I don't remember her name. But she was an old lady in the church there. And those words that she said to me one time after church to a very hesitant preacher. I never wanted to preach. Those words sustained me so many times because I knew somebody's praying for me. And I encourage you, choose, look at the people around you. Pray for these young people. Pray for the gift that God has placed in their lives, for the calling that God has for them. Rather than despising, rather than putting them down, lift them up and tell them, young man, God has a calling for your life and you better step up because you know what? You will never be happy anywhere else until God fulfills that plan with your life. Until you yield to the Lord, you're not going to be happy. Because the best place to be is in the center of God's will. When you are in the center of God's will, you'll see that, you know what? You may not have a whole lot in this world, but you have God and He is the provider of everything. And He will sustain you and he will give you more joy than than people have when they have millions in their account you will see that the greatest joy is the joy of the lord that fills your heart no matter the circumstance so many other examples of young people that have been used by the lord so mightily john the baptist was filled with the holy spirit while even in the womb before he was born i mentioned samuel earlier He's a little child at the, church, uh, the temple and, and he hears God's voice and God uses him to bring a word to Eli and for the nation. God can use your children even. God can use anybody. Do not despise the little ones. And if you see yourself as little, good. <laughs> because God stands against the proud. But remember, remember with God all things are possible. Another great example for me was Hudson Taylor. I, as a teenager, I, read, I used to read biographies, and I loved the biography of Hudson Taylor. You know, he was 17, year, year, 17 years old when he dared to see God and God's plan for his life. And he totally surrendered himself to God and said, God, whatever you want for my life, whatever your will is for me. Almost immediately, he felt a distinct impression that God wanted him to be a missionary to China. And he started to leave and began to prepare him in, in that way, to prepare himself for that, for the mission field. And by the time he was 22, he arrived in Shanghai. Five years later, he arrived in Shanghai. And God used him mightily in the nation of China. You see, there's so many other examples here. Ah, sovereign Lord. I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm only a child. What is your excuse for not saying yes? Whatever your plan is for my life, Lord, I want to embrace it. I want to accept it. I want to say yes to it. And look what God answers, what God says to Jeremiah. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. When God speaks, he speaks with both encouragement and persuasion. When God speaks, he speaks in a way that you cannot refuse. God knows how to speak to us in a way that leads us forward, that leads us on. And if you just listen, if you're honest with the Lord, and if you tell him all your fears, all the reasons why, Lord, I'm, I'm the wrong person, tell him all the right, wrong reasons. Lord, I'm not the one you're looking for. Tell him that, and God will show you why. Okay. Perfect. Now go on. That's how God does with Jeremiah. You see, 
If you read Jeremiah 17, verse 16, he remembers his reluctance. And he says, nor have I desired the woeful day. You know what came out of my lips. It was right before you, Lord. Later on in life, he, Jeremiah tells God, Lord, you know what I said. You know I, I, my feelings of feeling inadequate, of not being the right person. You know it's not me that I'm doing this for, Lord, but I'm willing to obey. Even in my reluctance, I'm doing your work, Lord, knowing that it's you that empowers me there uh, daily. And even though reluctant, he can't hold back. And this is how it is with God. Chapter 20, verse 9, he says, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But, he were, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Even if you say, I'm not going to listen, Lord. I'm not, I can't do this, Lord. You cannot. Because God's word convicts us, compels us, and brings us to obedience to him. And the message of the Lord to Jeremiah is so, so good. When he tells him, do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you. You see, Jeremiah had two reasons to fear. First, he was young. Nobody would listen, Lord. They were just going to mock me and maybe even worse, do, do worse things to me. And second, secondly, his word, uh, his message was hard to hear. His message was not a good one, was not one that people would embrace. was a very hard message, a message of condemnation, a message of judgment from the Lord for the people. But the presence of God with him was greater than any reluctance, was greater than anything else. And the, power, the presence of God with him was the reassurance that he needed to know that I can do this. If the Lord is with me, who can stand against me? Romans chapter 8, if the Lord is for us, who can stand against us? And Jeremiah knows, if only the Lord is with me, I can go, no matter what. And this is the assurance that we need daily. Is the Lord with you? Is the Lord with me? I can assure you based on his word that if you're following in his word, yes, he is. If you're doing if you're fulfilling his plan for your life, his calling for your life, yes, he is with you there. Because if God called you, he will never leave you alone. If God calls you to go a certain way, he's always with you. Just like he took the people of Israel out of Egypt. He didn't give them a map. Now you go figure it out on your own. He didn't even give them GPS. He could have. God is God. He said, my presence will be with you. And that is more than anything else we could ever desire. Because if God is with me, all sufficiency is with me. If God is with me, all powerful is with me. If God is with me, Jehovah Jireh, the provider, is with me. There's nothing that I can fear. Jehovah Nisi, my, my, my banner, the one in whose name I'm going, he is with me. You see, people send, and, and nations send ambassadors. And you go, you're on your own where you're going. But God doesn't do that. He is with you. And if he calls you like Daniel to go into a lion's den, he is with you there. And if he calls you like Joseph to be in the pit, he is with you there or in the prison. The Bible says that repeatedly, and God was with Joseph in the prison, no matter where. When you're in the center of God's will, he is with you there, no matter what the circumstance. And this is the reassurance that helps us overcome any reluctance. And in closing, I want to say this. God has a plan for your life too, young man, young lady. Do you know what that plan is? Have you sought it? Have you asked him? Have you spoken to the Lord about it? Did you talk to him? He is the most amazing person to ever engage in conversation with. Because even when he rebukes, he does it in love. He does it in a winsome way, not to destroy you, but to bring you back to the plan, to the design that he had for your life. 
Have you talked to him about it? Do you know his plan for your life? Are you willing to commit to it? What is your excuse? Do you know that the greatest promise we can ever have is this? And I will be with you always to the end of the earth. Matthew 28, verse 20. Jesus himself said, and I go, make disciples, fulfill my, the calling I have for your life, for the mission I have for the church, for you. And know that in this, I'm not sending you alone. Yes, I'm sending you like sheep in the middle of wolves, but I am with you. And this assurance is more than enough for me to say, yes, Lord, here I am. Cleanse me, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your power. And send me. Will you do the same? Amen. Amen. Let us stand, please. And let us prepare for worship. And I want to... There's not much to add here. And I don't look to add to Moise's message. But I want to tell you that by chance, I had, it's not by chance, but I had a conversation which really worked in my life last week. There was someone that was extremely busy and very successful, and he was at the dinner table, and he said, you know what? I have never been happier in my life than when I was serving the Lord. Never. I have never been more fulfilled and happier and felt like I'm in my purpose, like this is what the Lord has for me. And he looked at me and he said, what am I doing? And I said, I have the same feeling. And then later on, another conversation, I have the same feeling. And then another person, I have the same feeling. We are meant to serve the Lord. Amen. We are called to serve the Lord. And you, we will chase and we will run and chase and look everywhere and we will end up exactly where we were and that is the emptiness that is we will be seeking everything and find nothing until it is seeking the lord it's a circle and i'm back and i know many of you are back there we have to serve the lord and you know what's beautiful about the lord is that he keeps pulling us back. When we think we're most successful, when we think we've had it all, that is when I have been, and many of us have been, the most empty. Empty. Our true purpose is in serving the Lord. So if you don't know your purpose, it doesn't matter what age. And my, many times we have to reevaluate our purpose. We have 10 minutes. To begin seeking the Lord, calling upon his name, saying, Lord, what is my purpose? How can I serve you? And if it means mopping the floors and telling the people next to me about you, that's what it's going to be. And if it means starting something huge and investing something huge for your kingdom, that's what it's going to be. But Lord, I want to serve you. Or we're just going to be running in circles over and over again. Let us worship. And let's really meditate upon this, especially the young people. I look at them at youth. And I was there. We are all there. What is your purpose? And, and high energy, like Moises said, we need to be patient with them and loving. Youth, all I can say is, while you're seeking your purpose in Christ, while you're seeking your purpose, serve the Lord. Amen. Serve the Lord while you're seeking your exact purpose because in seeking the Lord his purpose can be revealed let us worship
sing. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine a light and, and the whole world sing. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can. Așa de frumos a ei, nici vorbele, nici amăgirile, nici apăsările, nici mirile, nici nimic. Ce și cine ne va putea despărți de dragostea ta de Dumnezeu?
binecuvântat să fie numele Tău. Doamne, Tu ești prezent. Duhul meu e cercetat, Doamne. Te văd la lucru. Și mă rog în seara aceasta chemarea la mântuire să fie auzită de orice suflet. Mă rog, Doamne, și cer ca mântuirea Ta să curgă peste sufletele noastre. Și, Doamne, mă rog chemarea la slujire, la sfințire, la trăi o viață în planul Tău, în voia Ta. Doamne, poate că sunt persoane în seara aceasta care s-au rugat și au cerut ca voia Ta să li se reveleze. Poate că sunt persoane care au ales în seara aceasta, în taina inimii lor, să spună, Doamne, sunt aici la dispoziția Ta. Te rog să onorezi rugăciunea lor și să-i tragi, Doamne, în voia Ta. Și la jugul lui Hristos să tragem toți. Da, Doamne, ne găsim împlinirea sufletului și o bucurie sfântă atunci când suntem în voia Ta. De aceea mă rog pentru poporul Tău în seara aceasta pe toți să ne aliniez după dreptarul Tău. Doamne, Tu onorezi rugăciunile noastre, Tu răspunzi rugăciunilor noastre. Doamne, vreau să-ți mulțumesc că sunt în seara aceasta împreună cu părinții mei și copiii mei în adunare. Și mă rog ca această, acest exemplu, această priveliște să continue, Doamne. Mă rog pentru copiii mei și copiii fraților mei ca să ridici generația aceasta. Chemarea Ta să găsească, Doamne, în inima lor un pământ bun. Doamne, copiii și copiii copiilor noștri să răspundă, Doamne, dacă nu vei veni chemării Tale. Aleluia! Te rog, Doamne Dumnezeule, e o mișcare a Duhului Tău în biserica noastră. Au venit, Doamne, persoane și mi-au spus că au fost botezate cu Duhul Sfânt, că le-ai botezat cu Duhul Sfânt. Aș vrea să te rog în seara aceasta cercetarea Duhului Tău să fie peste popor Amen. și de aici, Doamne, să fim schimbați, să fim umpluți cu putere pentru a birui, Doamne, așa cum ne-ai spus dimineața. Vom birui pentru că biruitorul este cu noi. Lăudat să fie numele Tău. Ridică, Doamne, au fost și a fost o săptămână plină de încercări pentru mulți, dar bine cuvântăm numele Tău, că nu ne-ai lăsat, că astăzi stăm în picioare, pentru că Tu ne-ai binecuvântat. O, cât de credincios ești Tu, Doamne, că n-am fost încercați mai mult decât am putut duce. Ai fost cu noi acasă, ai fost cu noi pe drum, ai fost cu noi la spital și vei rămâne cu noi pe oriunde ne va duce viața aceasta. Nu vom murmura, ci vom binecuvânta numele Tău. Mă rog, Doamne, în seara aceasta, cum l-ai chemat pe Ieremia, să mai chem, Doamne, copiii noștri, să mai chem, Doamne, Dumnezeule, generație după generație. Și, Doamne, eu știu că biserica este a Ta, Tu o vei zidi și nimeni nu o va birui. Aleluia! Mă rog, Doamne, pentru ca o cercetare sfântă a Duhului Tău să continuă să fie în orice inimă. Doamne, așezăm această săptămână în puterea Ta și vrem să o trăim, Doamne, victorioși de aceea, Te rog. Fii cu noi, Doamne, vom pleca de aici binecuvântați cu Tine în inimă. Pun numele Tău, Doamne, peste orice familie, pun numele Tău peste orice suflet și chem, Doamne, puterea Ta să ne ridice, Doamne, pe fiecare, să ne fii scut și pavăză, să ne fii direcție în viață. Aleluia! 
Te binecuvânt, Doamne, și îți mulțumesc pentru că astăzi ne-am putut aduna aici, în locul acesta. Astăzi nu doar ai turnat ploaie peste pământ, ci ai turnat ploaia Duhului Tău peste inima noastră. Binecuvântat să fii, Doamne! Îți mulțumesc că la Biserica Grace e har! Aleluia! Doamne, vom pleca, dar vom pleca cu Tine! Ne vom duce la casele noastre și vom binecuvânta numele Tău, că tot ceea ce avem e datorită Ție. Din Tine, prin Tine și pentru Tine sunt toate lucrurile lăudat și binecuvântat să fii. Doamne, Dumnezeul nostru, amin. Vă binecuvântăm pe toți în numele Domnului. Vă dorim tuturor o săptămână binecuvântată. Duminica viitoare se va predica cuvântul Domnului din nou. La slujba de dimineață, fratele Dan va rosti cuvântul Domnului. Iar seara vom asculta promisiunile Domnului cu referire la cântarea Iată, eu fac toate lucrurile noi. Fratele Ricci va predica. Cred că este un moment în care Dumnezeu cercetează Biserica Grace. Cred. Văd și mă rog, haideți să ne sfințim toți, să venim lângă Domnul, să ne apropiem de Domnul și fie ca Dumnezeu să binecuvânteze biserica Lui. Este șapte și un sfert. Aș vrea să cântăm o cântare de bucurie și de laudă și în versul acestei cântări, în partea finală, să mergem la casele noastre cu pacea Domnului și cu însoțirea Domnului. Fiți binecuvântați de Domnul. O cântare de bucurie. Nu uitați ceea ce spunea psalmul. Gata? Îmi este inima să cânte Dumnezeu.
Messiah, only the voices. Jesus Messiah. 